Snow? Hello everybody, good evening, welcome to a rather cold Edinburgh, if you're live streaming into this event, it is minus four outside and it is slightly above freezing inside and uh, welcome to the Library of Mistakes if you're in the room and haven't been here before, just a little bit about the library in case this is your first visit, this is a free public library uh, and if you want to attend simply register at our website libraryofmistakes.com uh, and you can make an appointment and come along uh, Monday to Saturday 9 to 5 uh, and use this wonderful library. You will also be invited to lectures at the library and we run a podcast series as well. Uh, and the focus of this library is business and financial history, but we don't call it the business and financial history library because nobody would come. But uh, Library of Mistakes seems to hit, uh, ring a bell and uh, you're very, very welcome. Uh, thanks again tonight to our drink sponsors, Kennox uh, Asset Management. Uh, tonight I'm delighted to introduce Philip Rosner, who is the Professor of Early Modern History at Manchester University. He's the author of at least five books. We're trying to work out how many. He must have started writing when he was about 12, anyway. Uh, the next one will be called Managing the Wealth of Nations, and tonight's talk is uh, looking back into the past to tell us something we can learn about the future. Uh, and once again, we have a historian to do that, not an economist. There must be a good reason for that, Philip. I'm sure you'll explain it to us, so over well. to you. Well, thank you very much, Russell, for that invitation. Very kind, a very illustrious place, and a library of mistakes. I hope you haven't made a mistake. I definitely haven't made a mistake <laughs> coming here. It's a wonderful occasion. Well, really well-appointed library. Um, what can we learn from history? Um, we often hear, especially from the historian's profession, that we cannot really learn much or necessarily look for lessons from history. We better study history on and their historical actors in their historical times trying to make sense of how they did things and why they did things. But apart from that, history very often doesn't seem much more than a convenient and interesting pastime for those who practice it to be studied for its own sake entirely. And I'm not sure whether I quite agree with that. I, I think we do learn a lot from history or can learn a lot from history if we treat history sensibly even from some unexpected corners farther back. As usual, history, while it's not exactly repeating itself, keeps coming back, often from unexpected corners and things that may seem innovative, original, or inventive on the surface, turn out upon second inspection as old wine in new pipes. The new UK industrial policy, for instance, built back Better is, in fact, such an example based on collaboration between industry, science, and government. As it says, focusing on strengthening urban life, the 21st century global way of life, as it seems, and creativity. It centers on strong, I quote, an active government investing massively in science and technology coupled with a dynamic enterprise economy. End of quote. And when I read that, um, this paradigm seemed to quite echo some of the stuff that I've been studying recently and trying to kind of make sense of it in the forthcoming book. And I don't know whether the book makes sense. I'm, I'm often asking myself, but I hope it does. At least it did to the publisher. But a lot of what I found in early modern political economy and economic theory sounds very similar. And that is a model of capitalism or coordinated capitalism, if you could call it, that is known by the name of cameralism. And that, of course, is a very strange beast. Whenever I ask my student, they, they, some of them will have heard about mercantilism because I teach early modern political economy. But no one will have heard about cameralism. At that time, in the early modern period, cameralism was something like a mainstream political economy or economic doctrine. It was a system that amounted to something like an early modern mainstream ideology of growth, radically pro-innovation, pro-market, pro-creativity. 
and pro-government at the same time. It aimed at achieving lasting economic change and development through proactive government intervention, simultaneously enhancing the quality of economic activities and economic life, focusing on issues like employment, adding value and raising productivity, and economic life. This included from what's nowadays known as mission-orientated or industrial policy, some of the newer buzzwords from heterodox economists to kind of move perhaps more into the mainstream, um, to wider measures of public welfare, including clean streets, safe roads, and sound quarantine rules in times of pandemics. Karl Marx, in Capital, missed a great opportunity when he did derogate, completely ridiculed, cameralism, claiming that modern political economy was exclusively based on English writers from the 17th century onwards. Into the 1870s, political economy, according to Marx, as taught in the German-speaking lands, had remained, as he said, foreign signs, an import from the English and the French, as he argued in his 1873 postscript to Das Kapital. On the German tradition and economic analysis, cameralism or Kameralwissenschaften, as the contemporaneous term was known, was a technique of administration and finance in the service of the princely states and taught at German universities since the 1720s. Marx, however, completely ridiculed that snobbishly, commenting that cameralism was a, quote, a silly mishmash of practices and insights and purgatory which the hopeful, in the fourth edition changed to the hopeless, candidate for a bureaucratic career in the service of the state has to undergo. End of quote. Modern, or in Marxian terms, bourgeois political economy was invented in England, as Marx argued in writings we nowadays associate with mercantilism, another one of these isms which are uh, immensely problematic to the historian, to say the least. In the Marxist tradition, con Mercantilism, ironically called monetarism by adherents of that school, was early modern bourgeois political economy reflecting the interests and policies of capitalist classes in early modern capitalism. And I don't think that Marx was right in that regard. He was right in many other, or interesting in many other regards, but not, not in that. I mean, he, he really missed a great opportunity here. Cameralism, or cameralist texts, written in the epistemic tradition of the medieval princess mirrors genre, often did reflect the viewpoint of the prince or the princely state. As some have argued, some of these texts were literally too good to be true, sketching hypothetical worlds and models that never um, lived up to reality. Cameralist books were also organized in a peculiar way are often clumsy to read, very boring read, often very complicated, convoluted, even to a native speaker trying to make sense of some of what these writers wanted to say it can be challenging. But Cameron's texts teem with descriptions and learned analyses of capitalist behavior and markets. We need to read between the lines, especially in their sections on monetary policy and regulation, we find ample evidence of how political economy came to address the changing economic circumstances of the day, transitions to capitalism and the making of modern economic development. The cameralist model, um, I argue in my book, laid the foundations for the wealth of nations and significantly helped Europe undergo the crucial transformation to modern economic growth and industrialization. Now, what was the cameralist model about? And there's a few components. It was about much more, but I'm just going to synthesize which I thought were the most salient. First of all, the aspect of transformation and change. Cameralism was all about change. The cameralists hated the status quo. They wanted to improve products and productivity, reform existing production regimes, improve the fate of the common wheel. There's a German proverb, Stillstand ist Rückschritt, stagnation is regression, or to stand still means moving backward, which captures cameralist economic philosophy quite well. Early modern Germans were generally literate and well-trained. Manufacturing was ubiqu ubiquitous, and they 
German traders and merchants were involved in global trades. In terms of living standards, income levels and trade connectivity, however, Germany was hampered by a general crisis and the disastrous 30 years war, which made for a little bit of backward outlook of capitalist economy or capitalist economics, which has also been described accordingly as an economics or economic theory trying to achieve catch-up growth with the leaders of the time, the Netherlands, France, and England. So transformation is uh, big on the agenda. Discovery of the future is another of the modern future, a very important epistemic shift. Since the turn of the 17th century, Cameralist writers increasingly noted that the human future was open and manageable, not preordained by God. Humans were no mindless slaves to the wheel of fortune anymore, but could design their own economic futures. This was quite a change compared to the Middle Ages, where not much of an open future had been known. But knowing about the future and the idea that the future is open and manageable is, of course, one of the key conditions of modern capitalism in many regards. In modern capitalism, the future is principally unknown, but considered manageable, foreseeable, and um, forecastable. And the Cameralists would have agreed, at least with the illusion that the future is, that is the conviction that humans, if they're equipped with instruments of reason, rationality, and science, may make reasonable forecasts about their fate and future. Notions of an economic future, rudimentary, had existed since the Middle Ages. The commercial revolution, the banking, business, and commerce innovation in medieval Italy had paved the material foundations of the Italian Renaissance and cannot, of course, be envisioned without some regard to the human future. But these models had generally been limited to specific actors and types of economic activities. Post-1600, Cameralist models, on the other hand, were different. They extended the realm of actors and number of individual open futures, desacralizing the human future from the general biblical context within which most future visions before 1600 had firmly rested. Around the same time, people also developed ideas about infinite growth, particularly in Sweden, but also in the German-speaking countries, by discovering the right techniques and deciphering the working laws of Mother Nature. In the German context, out of the disastrous circumstances of the Thirty Years' War, in Sweden, which was a major power and also adopted cameralism, um, the idea was born out of the Swedish idea of greatness, which was born out by Sweden's political role in the conflict. Many of these future visions and growth models, and this was a circle of intellectuals spanning across Europe, including English-speaking actors around Samuel Hartlip, many of their future visions and growth models originated within a cameralist frame of mind with a strikingly Swedish-German connection. Language and linguistic notions of economic order and dynamics played together in a close and intrinsic relationship. As yet, the German language had no separate word for future yet. That future, Zukunft, which is the modern word for German, at that time denoted the return of Christ, or the second coming of Christ. But after the mid-17th century, writers embarked upon some new important reconceptualizations of future, framing the human future, using a new grammatological words and phrases for it, developing a new and increasingly dynamic syntax of growth based on the concept of multiple contingent open economic futures. This remodeling of the future obviously had manifest impacts upon the economic spheres, making a signature contribution to the making of capitalism and, if you like, economic modernity. Camerists also believed that states and governments had an active role to play in making these new collective open futures work. What states were and what they did obviously changed massively across time and space. But the available many of strategies, the intellectual templates connected to economic statecraft governing capitalism were more comprehensive than is often acknowledged in the historical literature, particularly since the late medieval period. And states grew better at it over time. 
measures promoting welfare and happiness included, amongst other things, an ample supply of good coin, a sound monetary regulation, ordinances regulating trade and exchange on urban markets, stabilizing food supply, a fair layout of market stalls, clean air, safety on roads, and good sermons on Sunday in church. The ultimate goal was a well-spirited commonweal. Invariably, this included the promotion of manufacturing creativity, things like import substitution, um, industrial policy, and originality in crafting, designing, and shaping things, all tools that significantly contributed to what one scholar has called, again, completely dismissing, or almost completely, cameralism, a European culture of growth. Market regulation was important in the cameralist model because the better configured markets were, the more efficient they were in clearing, making sure that enough, that enough goods of sufficiently acceptable quality were provided for the well-being of the consumer. Market regulation extended from the hours of market access, the physical and spatial layout of market stores, to air ventilation, making sure that fish markets were kept separate from those for fowl or flesh or vegetables, providing safe roads um, and safe access to the market, regulating coin weights and measures, and have overseers taking care of the qualities bought and sold, of goods bought and sold in the marketplace, making sure no one was overcharged or overreached by tricksters, cheaters, manipulators, and usurers. Markets are, of course, an age-old institution. They can be documented long before capitalism and in world regions where capitalism never took hold or did so very late. But markets grew in importance since the Renaissance, particularly in Northwestern Europe, and capitalist economy took them seriously as the central hinge point of their economic models and their wider models of state and society and their visions of how a common wheel should flourish, a flourishing common wheel should look like. The same goes for money, which is another key institution for capitalism and the modern market economy. Invented, it was without doubt long before capitalism, but became increasingly vital as a tool of economic development as capitalism gained hold after the 1500s. Money was shot through with social and political dynamics as well as painful asymmetries that gave rise to many social conflicts. Money was a fundamental tool in the market process. It was an agent of social power, um, of monies, but also a tool of empowering the velocity or vivacity of economic life, as writers at the time would call it. Starting from medieval mod models of money's political, social, and economic function, dating back to Nicole Orem's De Moneta from the 1350s, texts that represent the origins of political economy, Cameralist monetary theory and policy assumed that money was an important economic institution and economic resource. By managing it well, keeping an eye on the quality and inherent goodness of it, of coins, trying to regulate some of the quantities minted, this would mean foreign merchants and traders would be drawn to the country, that business would flourish, business would increase, and so would taxes and overall economic activity. One premium goal of Cameron's political economy was currency stability and preventing inflation, management known to pre-industrial authors and rulers as tools promoting economic development. Now, when Adam Smith, and this is, of course, the best place to talk about Adam Smith, without doubt, in the second book of The Wealth of Nations, suggested that, I quote, parsimony and not industry is the immediate cause of the increase of capital, end of quote, he literally broke with a long tradition, European tradition of thought worth at least half a millennium before him that had claimed exactly the opposite. A prime cause of economic underdevelopment characteristic of, as Marx claimed, Asian modes of production was hoarding. Hoarding also haunted European political writers and economic thinkers since the Renaissance. Cameralists would have none of that. They hated money that was buried or locked away in treasure chests underground. Instead, they developed theories on how one could make money circulate more quickly, revolve more often around the economy. It was the role of the state uh, or the wise prince 
and their administration to guarantee a good level of circulation or umlauf in the original German and possibly to increase it. This would apply both to the amount of money in circulation as well as its frequency or revolution as it was called in contemporary discourse nowadays the perhaps the one legitimate approximation would be velocity although what the cameralists often described as vivacity or umlauf is not quite the same the more frequently money changed hands the more often people were empowered to do something with it as sonnenfels one of the later austrian cameralists in the 1780s claimed Monetary circulation and its vivacity, to again use the contemporaneous term, had both a spatial as well as dynamic chronological dimension. Foreign trade and payments had a direct impact on the level of domestic circulation, and there were important channels for the state to control and provide for a stable level and prevent a reduction of monetary circulation. Cameralists like Sonnenfels and many others identified payment of foreign debt, immigration, outflow of rent and interest charges, um, foreign investment, but also treasure building and hoarding by the prince and the public fisc as the basis, basic cause for decreases in velocity and the level of circulation, monetary circulation. Bad monetary management and overinvestment in gold and silver dishes and other um, errors were also named as causes for a decline in what they um, what, what we would call monetary mass, that is velocity, the times of um, the amount of circulating coin. This would have been especially problematic in Catholic countries, where especially in churches, a lot of ornament, ritual equipment, and decoration was made of, of gold and silver. And the Catholic churches are the natural places where, where precious metal, the main monetary input, was hoarded and locked away and kind of withdrawn from circulation. Luther, Martin Luther, and the reformers had criticized that heavily and done away with this in the 1520s and beyond. And some of the more radical variants of the Protestant faith, such as Calvinists and Presbyterians and iconoclasts, had more or less dealt away completely with ostentatious luxury and celebratory equipment altogether. Gold and silver were always convertible into either luxury goods or money, depending upon the individual situation and monetary demand. Borders were fluid. Martin Luther, in his table talk, reputedly quibbled that his household was a peculiar and strange one. More money was flowing out than coming in. In consequence, his wife, Catherine, often had to monetize or remonetize chalices and other silver dishes from the Luther household to make ends meet when the Luthers, who were actually quite well off in general, but often short of cash. Cameralists, later on, but there's a connection between Luther and the Cameralists because Luther's writings were often picked up by the Cameralists, argued that a decline in circulation and velocity would effectively increase interest rates and depress the level of economic activity across the country, leading to stops in production. The only social group that would profit from all this were the capitalists and rentiers. Now, the funny thing is that the term, the very term used in early modern cameralist models and political economy texts for hoarders, thus defined, was capitalisten, that in the original, that, that is where capitalist comes from. That is somebody who buries his money underneath the ground, sits on it, and doesn't invest it um, in the real economy, if you like. This is where the term capitalist come from. It is a cameralist term known from works like Philip Hernick's Austria Supreme, If Only She So, she so Wills, in 1684, one of the early modern bestsellers, and certainly many other writings, particularly since the second half of the 17th century. This terminology continued to have a long reach into 19th century German economics, alongside the historical school, people like Russia, uh, Gustav von Schmoller, but also long reached back, as I've argued, to Reformation discourses on monetary outflows, balance of payment problems, and monetary shortages. Cameralists, Cameralist political economy thereby, contributed to a debate on economic variables like velocity that 
to the present day is quite enigmatic because it cannot be measured, but only calculated after some other benchmarks of economic activity have been asserted, such as the volume of transaction and prices and monetary, the amount of money in circulation. Since the Middle Ages, moral and economic debates had evolved around concepts of parsimony, frugality, avarice, and thriftiness, often with a negative undertone. Cameralists thus turned velocity and the idea of vivacity of economic life into a manageable, variable, and economic tool to stimulate the market economy. But they did much more. Somewhat unoriginally, given that many other authors before him had used the example as a case in point, Smith in The Wealth of Nation picks up the pin manufactory as an example of the division of labor and then builds his um, work more or less around that. But rather than discussing the full implications in terms of value added and creativity that goes together with certain processes of division of labor, not generally speaking, Smith chose to proceed by demonstrating that the true origin of wealth, of the wealth of nations, lay in the division of labor, improving the distributional efficiency of the existing market <laughs> systems. But even for a pre-industrial economy, Smith's template of analysis, this wasn't completely the case. Political economy had much more in stock at that time. Smith thus missed out on a great opportunity. Where did the wealth of nations originate? With a pin manufacturer, he was on the right track. He had a good instinct, but missed the point somewhat. The origin of the wealth of nations was not in division of labor per se, but division of labor and specific types of enterprise that embodied new philosophies of material transformation, efficiency increase, and ways of new ways of transforming matter. Since the 16th century, it had been consensual amongst European writers to see manufacturing as the activity, particularly at of crafting things, transforming things as the main source of national product productivity. Manufacturing embodied skills, new machines, new production regimes, new techniques, value added, curiosity, creativity, learning, and much more um, than other activities, such as farming, mining, um, or trade. Manufacturing provided the foundations for capitalism, industry, and the wealth of nations. How much more time do I have? Uh, would you like another 10 minutes? OK. This this occasions us to reconsider the history of the wealth of nations in a deeper history time frame through continental contributions often left from modern narratives. So just to briefly recap what Cameralism was about and then perhaps offer a few points for discussion in regards to modern times. So certainly Cameralists believed in the idea that growth was good. They did have a dynamic vision of society, a dynamic vision of economy, a dynamic vision of the future. They believed in manufacturing and creativity and the ideas of transforming matter into a higher order stage. They considered markets as organic and the economy as organic, not, me not mechanic, and thoroughly embedded within wider social and cultural dimensions. Because they considered the economy to be thus embedded in wider notions such as the need for justice, spirituality, and a good life, Mercantilists and the Cameralists accepted laissez-faire as a principle for the market economy, but under conditions that the state or the king or the prince had a duty to intervene whenever or wherever markets went wrong and conditions of the good life were violated. This occasioned a close watching and monitoring and, if necessary, redesigning of markets. Contrary to many con uh, common assumptions, Cameralists, which are often reckoned to the mercantilist spectrum, this is something, a notion I'm not completely comfortable with, um, but it has kind of played out in the literature. Contrary to that notion, Cameralists were concerned with creating rather than destroying wealth by means of zero-sum games and other accusations commonly levied against uh, mercantilism or simply distributing wealth. They thus made a signature contribution to the wealth of nations. Now, if there are any lessons today for today, what, what were these? And once again, I believe that Cameralism provides just a few hints, perhaps a way of learning from history. 
specific recommendations that continue to matter today, um, I believe, included that capitalism is good, perhaps the best way to maximize welfare, but it must not be confused with laissez-faire or light-touch government. If it, is work to, if it is to work well, capitalism needs good design, good market design, strong rules, committed politicians, committed administrators, and quite heavyweight government. Secondly, in order to achieve lasting transformation and growth, policy must target the right economic activities and choose the right regulatory tools. With a commitment, again I'm quoting from the new economic policy of the UK government, to attract the globally brightest people and developing the regulatory system in a way that supports creativity and innovation, end of quote, the UK government certainly is on the right track. Yet recent debates have certainly been overshadowed by Brexit, fisheries and other economic activities that perhaps are marginal to British um, economic wealth and UK incomes, output and productivity growth. Capitalists were quite adamant about industry and the virtue of industry because of the value added, the multiplier effects, the um, economies of scale embedded in it. So perhaps this is something to think about for the future in terms of those activities that are long-lasting, with long-lasting income effects. Camelist's third point would argue that you should target economic activities that are resilient and historically crisis-proof. Um, once again, quoting from the report, UK businesses have a good recent record in creating jobs, and a quote, but the UK is suffering from comparatively low productivity levels. Since 2007, productivity growth has stalled, are the jobs being created there for the right ones? Supporting the creative industries is a good thing, without doubt. And as an historian, I would always endorse that. But it is not always clear what these creative industries are. There should be manifest links between creativity and productivity. And that has also bearing on non-higher education, tertiary education. The UK punches far above its weight globally in terms of the share of the workforce with a university degree. UK academia is world leading. Yet once again there is a mismatch with productivity figures and there is little prima facie evidence suggesting a particularly strong correlation between higher education, our university degrees and income or productivity levels. Um, a culture of high-powered, non-HIEI tertiary education should be resurrected. Creativity, skill, and material literacy, something that also comes up in the report, i.e. the ability to understand, work with, and transform physical matter into something useful, is not something you usually pick up at a university. The contribution made by useful, not university knowledge in the vocational craft-based industry sector has been much more important in the long term, generating and maintaining economic growth. So perhaps it may be worthwhile to rebuild industry, and particularly those industries that create tangible um, value, because it's usually tangible value added, or high specific industries working with economies of scale that generate long-lasting economic growth. Um, at the present day, value added in manufacturing and industry contribute less than 10% to GDP. The UK kind of competes at the same level with Angola or Afghanistan. In the 1990s, it was 17% still, which is today's um, figure for Germany. Manufacturing still contributes a lot to UK workforce, but not as much to incomes and productivity. And perhaps there is a point in thinking about industry and which particular industries may be used in order to reduce the economy's success susceptibility to trade shocks arising from global instability, politically risky economic powers, insecure commodity chains, and also financial markets, which, as we've seen historically, are likely to break down quite regularly. Last but not least, I think one of the fundamental lessons I would have learned is from the Camelist, make people happier. Happiness was the main developmental goal and the sort of central conceptual framework for Camelist political economy. 
under which everything else was subordinated. Happiness was achieved through a well-managed monetary landscape, productive industry, productive manufacturing, well-regulated markets, and certainly this is something we could perhaps use to define policy in the 21st century. Thank you very much. Philip, thank you. I wanted to go start at the past and bring to the to, to where we are today. In in your book, you paint this incredible picture of people studying this subject and then going and trying to find a prince who would employ them. And there were a lot of princes. And uh, you also, I mean, it seems from what I've read on chimeralism, your description, that it is also a product of the Reformation. Do you think that's right? It, and uh, so I was interested after the Treaty of Westphalia, was there? Were the Protestant princes more likely, was this seen as a, as a Protestant thing, or did the Catholic princes take it up? Is this responsible for some of the divisions in Germany today, or, or where did the Cameronism fit in in, the, in that post-1648 period? That's a good question on, on, on many levels, Russell, and um, many, many scholars would have argued that it, it is, has something to do with the Reformation, or at least is particularly prominent in reformed countries. There's perhaps also a geographical um, demarcation line. Many of those countries, which happen to be the places where the armies in the Thirty Years' War went hither and thither, later on, because they were quite heavily affected by the war, seem to have adopted Cameralist templates early on. The godfather of Cameralism, for instance, Veit Ludwig von Seckendorf, who kind of came up with, with one of the most comprehensive early Cameralist treatises in the 1650s, happens to come from a place, a small princely, princelet, princedom, that was particularly heavily affected by the Thirty Years' War. And also in, in that area, obviously, most of the princes were Protestant. Nevertheless, I mean, you're raising implicitly the Max Weber question about Protestantism and capitalism, and that there is something to commend to it. Um, you could say that, that many of the Cameralist administrators and writers did have a reformed background, but we also find other examples to the contrary, like Philip Wilhelm von Herdig or Wilhelm von Schröder, who actually became a member of the Royal Society in uh, in the second half of the 17th century, traveled widely across England and also Scotland, where he looked at some of the, the mining ventures and so on. These were Catholics. Um, the, the third one, the third prominent ca uh, Catholic Cameralist, doesn't quite fit the bill of the reformed um, Protestant Cameralist, would be Johann Joachim Becher, proverbial polymath. But the funny thing is these three were all Converted, So they had originally been reformed, or Lutherans, but then converted to Catholicism um, without a profoundly, I suppose, utilitarian perspective <laughs> because they wanted to get jobs at the Catholic um, court in, in Vienna. So yes, you can make, mm. make that point, but the thing is, Cameralism then traveled. It traveled to places like Portugal, um, Spain, obviously also places like Denmark and Sweden by means of translation, translating works or even standalone works, authors like Anders Berg, who is like Sweden's great 18th century political economist, who is also commonly reckoned to the Cameralist spectrum. And the other thing that strikes me is money and the importance of, of regulated money. Now, that would have been difficult during the Thirty Years' War for obvious reasons. Uh, we had our own problems here with money in the 16th and 17th century. But Germany invents the Tauler, doesn't it? Well, it's invented in, in, uh, in what is now the Czech Republic. But all the princes take to it with great alacrity, and they form a, a solid currency which is tradable all over the, the planet. Was there something about cameralism which helped with produce this wonderful silver coin, which was a pretty regular consistency and accepted everywhere when other nations we're struggling to, to find that currency. So is a, a strong, and we think of Germany today, we think of it as the land of the hard currency. Is, is there any legacy from imperialism coming through that? I, I think so, yes, even though that perhaps dates back even earlier because um, obviously the, the Tala takes its name from, the, from Yachimov, which is nowadays the Czech Republic, but the, the first actually who kind of invented it as a permanent currency were the Saxon dukes and electors who created that currency in the 1500s. Um, long before we find the first 
political economy text that we commonly reckon to Cameralism, but there is a tradition without any doubt. If you look at the debates in the 1520s and 1530s about stable money, sound money, they have interesting debates in central Germany, those lands which later on also kind of invented Cameralism or where Cameralism played a role. People even played around with the idea of devaluing a currency to make it more competitive, to make domestic goods more competitive on international markets, even though this at the time was a profoundly heterodox stance. Most Cameralists insisted firmly upon currency being stable, being sound, being hard. It must be hard currency. The problem with the Tala, of course, it's it's a nice co coin. Everyone <laughs> wants to have it, which means it, it usually disappears once you put it in circulation. Somebody else takes it away. This is Gresham's law. But Cameralists yeah. were quite adamant, at least in principle, about... Well, when, we, when we did the recoinage of the Scottish currency in 1707, there were some of them, in, quite a few of them in Edinburgh as well. That's how good a coin it was. Uh, and little pieces of it as well. Uh, moving forward a, a little bit to the modern era, two th uh, a couple of things jump out from this, which is you finish at the end talking about education. So Germany has this different form of education in terms of technical schools. Maybe we used to have it, we don't have it now. And a bigger manufacturing base. Is that a legacy of this school of economic thought as well, that Germany has this difference, certainly from the United Kingdom? I think so, yes. And, and that, that is not entirely my own idea. I must give due credit to heterodox um, economists like Eric Reinhardt. And it's, it's being picked up by, by other economists nowadays, like Mariana Mazzucato from UCL uh, in London. The, the, the idea about useful economic activities, mission-orientated policies. Um, I think, yes, the answer, the short answer would be yes, because um, manufacturing seems to have been quite central in Cameralist thought. If there was anything, and that has to do with the, how the global or the international economy is structured in the 16 hundreds and the 1700s. You have of got Spain, of course, which is a big empire spanning nearly across the entire globe. And Spain has the large silver mines in Southern America where they got like huge volumes of silver year after year. Many of the German and other European countries don't have native silver mines. They need to generate silver, which is the main input for the currencies by means of foreign trade. And what emerges in the cameras literature is one of the central tropes, and they actually talk about it by ways of metaphor, and metaphor is very important in economics. The, the Spanish gold mine, they say, we have our own gold mine. Our gold mine is manufacturing industry. Our gold mine is the industry that we have because we can put so many people into paid employment. We can, can generate dyna dynamic um, output volumes, uh, benefit from economies of scale. Manufacturing is our gold mine, and that is a metaphor, a trope that p comes up in many of the writings I've studied, but also writings like by, by Swedish people at the same time, like Christopher Polham or Anders Berg. So it seems like a common trope, this metaphor of our, our gold mine. We don't need gold mines or silver mines in that case, as the Spanish do. And in fact, the, Span the Spaniards get impoverished on the rich sources of silver because they, they have got an overabundance of silver. They abolish manufacturing in the 16th century. Industry is really killed off in, in 16th century Spain. Spanish industry becomes completely uncompetitive as a consequence partially of that huge silver resources that they have. And the cameras said, we, we can do better. We have the manufacturers, we can compete, punch far way above our Oh, wait. The, the English did their best to uh, help the Spanish with that. A man called Sir Francis Drake tried his very best to stop them getting all that silver, so uh, to, he just wasn't successful enough. Um, they, didn't, they didn't know he was helping them at the time, but obviously he was. Uh, what, one of the things that seems to set it apart is the willingness of the state or the prince to regulate. Uh, when I think of that in this country in that era, I think of the guilds, and the guilds were supposed to do that. Uh, but you seem to suggest that the princes were better at it than the guilds, or the guilds obviously had conflicts of interest, let's put it that way. Uh, do you think the cameralism model of the state doing that rather than the guilds doing this was a, was a better way of doing it? That's a good question again. The, the cameralists, they, they knew the guilds, and they had a, the guilds had a role to play in their models, but, but many cameras like Johann Justi, who was kind of the, 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 the leading figure of the German Enlightenment in, in the 18th century contemporary of Adam Smith, 
uh, who wrote massive treatises and kind of really kind of defined the genre in the 18th century, he absolutely hated guilds. He said, well, they have a role to play, certainly in terms of organizing bits and pieces like the training and some basic skill levels. But in the way they, they curb the markets, they, they, they form carter-like or monopoly-like associations. They actually inhibit the, the free flow of goods. They reduce efficiency of the market. They put others at a disadvantage. So in terms of the guilds limiting market access, which, which was what guilds traditionally did in the Middle Ages, because they regulated who would have access to the market, who would be able or allowed to produce, um, they, they wouldn't like that. So they, they saw a role for guilds, but more in the modern sense, what in the 19th century becomes known as the Handelskammern or Chambers of Commerce, the sort of internal, informal um, regulation of the industry, but, but not, not what they were initially meant, meant to do. Okay. Well, I, I can sit and ask you questions about the early modern monetary theory for a long time, and but uh, everybody else here also gets a chance to ask questions. Uh, somewhere I have a lovely assistant with a microphone. There he is. Uh, if you would like to ask a question, please put your hand up, and Charles shall come with, uh, with the microphone. Yeah, there's one. Well, we, we'll have to come forward. Paul. Okay, the microphone is coming this way. So, I think most people have heard of mercantilists and Marxists and capitalists. I've never heard of these people. <laughs> what happened? <laughs> um, yeah, strange question. Um, once again, they, they, they used to be the mainstream. They disappeared. And, and that is just one of the funny things that happens after the mid-late 19th century, where when economic science becomes really dominated by French, but particularly English, um, later on classical, neoclassical, economics. I think Marx had a role to play with, with, with kind of derogating, uh, completely dismissing. In, in many of the, uh, and, and that is beyond my territory, the 19th century economics and economic thought, but from what I've known is it, it continued to live on and, and massive, with, with massive importance, particularly in, in, in Germany in the 19th century. And the, the historical school is obviously an offshoot of cameralism. Um, people like Frederick List, who kind of rests uneasily, because List, actually, the development economist, he kind of experiences late waves of cameralism, but at the same time, the new tradition of the historical school is being developed. Wilhelm Roscher, Gustav von Schmoller, later on Werner Sombart, Max Weber, even to an extent. This is a tradition of economic thinking that's fairly different, even from the Austrian school or even from, from British political economy. The two don't quite seem to interact in the 19th century. Well, what happens in the 20th century, of course, economics, and once again, the historian speaking who was kind of read up on this, um, is, 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 is increasingly dominated by the Americans and people like Paul Samuelson and, and a couple of influential textbooks that stake the field and kind of claim to be mainstream and by that operation and become mainstream. There's no line of descent into the Austrians at all. I can't see any. Is that right? Austrian just comes from somewhere else, a completely different tradition, the Austrians? Yeah. Yeah. It's just the way, I mean, it's difficult to, to, to answer why, but, but there, there's, a, there's a process of displacement and a process of intellectual hegemony, which has a lot to do with, with of course, particular US economic dominance, and of course the UK economic dominance in world trade, finance and production since the, late, since the 19th century. I think Ray, Ray has a question. No. You've uh, focused really on northern, northern Europe. Um, bearing in mind perhaps the Arabic trading markets, you know, history or China, was there any comparable economic, similar economic thinking over there in these other, these other parts of the world? Difficult to know. You caught me um, cold-handed, so to speak. I think this, this was quite peculiar for Northern Europe. It may have to do with the politics of the emerging fiscal military state. Some people have claimed, for instance, that the Chinese in the early modern period adhered to more or less a fair and principles, which would, of course, be an anachronism. But um, 
it seems like the Chinese state was interfering in, in other areas of the economy, but perhaps not so much so directly in industry or manufacturing. Um, a scholar from Boston, Prashanan Patasarati, in a recent book has made a similar claim with regards to the Ottoman Empire, um, that they would have followed an ideology of cheap provisioning as the supreme goal, um, which meant that they, for instance, were favorable to allow imports into the country, whereas capitalists and mercantilists, of course, were skeptical about certain imports and, and were quite happy in, in many cases to apply protective tariffs to uh, if they considered a particular industry or production worthy of protection. So you, I think you can see such differences um, over time. I would say they, they are, they're pretty idiosyncratic, northern European. In the modern Chinese state, we just think of it as mercantilist. Do you see any chimeralism in it, or is it just pure mercantilism? Well, <laughs> as, as I mentioned earlier, I have problems with the term mercantilism, because mercantilism insinuates in some form that this is an ideology that is somehow trade-driven, or somehow driven on the idea that there's a rogue competition in international trade, and you just try to place at all costs your competitor out of world markets by um, applying across the board the whole tool of um, protectionism. Um, whereas the, the most mercant even mercantilists like Thomas Mann, who's the influential figure picked up by figures like Smith later on, or Stuart, Smith's contemporary. Um, Stuart actually was a bit of a cameralist. And people have claimed that Stuart well, that, was more... That's interesting, because Alexander Hamilton read a lot of Stuart. Yep. So uh, this is, there, is there a link through Stuart then into Alexander Hamilton? Definitely. According to, to Eric Reinhardt, who's really my witness here, the crown witness, um, the heterodox economist, there, there is. Um, there, he's a, there's a direct tradition. Uh, Hamilton's report on manufacturers mm -hmm. very much picks up the, uh, the, the, the cameralist program. And, and these are lines that are definitely apparent. So mercantilism, mercantilists actually weren't so, so, so concerned with trade. They were, all, they were more interested in production. Um, so it's a mercantilism is in many ways a, a mis misnomer. Um, so what we've already discovered is a whole musical about camelism. <laughs> <laughs> so it survives in the form of a musical called Hamilton. So yes. it, it's, it's just kind of everywhere, right? Uh, do we have, there's one more question, Paul. Uh, yeah, I guess, uh, well, more appropriate for a place where we do uh, we wonder about fi finance and banking. Where, where do they stand on the matter of credit, uh, especially since they believe in a, a more regulated approach to the economy uh, in a period of user limits? Where would they stand on this type of debate? And also considering that they can, it, the, the ideology is exported to places like Sweden, but they've got the Netherlands next door, and that is in its great era of, of financial strength. So did they just ignore that, or was it a hostile territory, the Dutch? Or? They, they, did, they did up in their treatises. Um, I haven't quite ignored that, but um, it was not, not in my focus. They, they did have um, sections on banking, on credit, I mean, nearly all of them would advocate a central bank that deals with the currency and makes sure that exchange kind of is, 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 is kind of on a regular way because there are hundreds of different currencies floating about in Germany. Um, they, they very much often even say that the, the prince or the ruler, the duke, should put away some of the, his princely chests, some of the money, the state finance, or even the private domain money, whatever the prince has to, to dispose of, um, to put into a bank to offer by means or extending credit to the economy at times where domestic credit is scarce. So, so they're, they're very much in, in favor of, of, a, of a functioning credit system. They usually end up at, at 5 or 6% as the legitimate interest rate. That, that is a sort of perennial since the Middle <laughs> Ages. The 5% is the sort of normal for most financial products, the, the, the normal interest rates. We're still along way from 5%, but I, I, I believe 5% is a, is, a, is a natural rate. It's funny, because in Jane Austen, there's nothing more uh, acceptable than a man earning 5% on guilt, so uh, yeah. that 5% yeah. yeah. seems to persist everywhere, and everybody wants their 5%. Their 5%. Uh, can, I, uh, can I have one, uh, one question, and just uh, asking on the government and also monetary systems, what, what is the role of competition and change in there, i.e., you know, now we have one government in the UK, we have one government in the US. 
back then you had many different ones. Does the role of competition and, and substitutions, and does that play a role that would be hard to recreate in our current system? That's a good question. Of, of course, that, that, that is a dynamic state system. It keeps shifting, and, and some powers like Prussia are, are rising up and kind of competing. Um, and others Sorry, I was thinking about the princes, because you were talking about individual princes and individual currencies, I mean, hundreds of currencies, yeah. as you said. Does that play a role in this? Yeah, yeah, d definitely. I mean, what, what the cameralists, um, and, and the, there's always the intricate balance of how to, do you balance the currency? Um, do you make it overweight or underweight? Um, many would argue it can be slightly underweight as long as it keeps, if it's within the country and not exported. They obviously pay attention to foreign, the other currencies, and they say there should be mint masters and experts established in every city and marketplace who take a look at what is currently in circulation and then tariff these currencies. And they, they, they sh should find out exchange rates that keep the money in the country, that kind of balance out um, exchange market. That's the theory. In practice, it works very differently. In practice, my experience with German currencies is, is that it's very complex, even chaotic. And even for modern historians, it's, it's very difficult to keep track. So how would people have um, at the time, and there, there's lots of fraud, um, overreaching, lots of currency coin speculation, coin manipulation, which the Kamalists are obviously aware of and say these problems need to be abolished. But there's also a long history claiming that you should have a good currency and long history of currency regulation, many rulers, that actually fails. So there's a certain gap between theory and practice here, which, which needs, needs to be claimed. But, um, that's always, of course, the, the, the thing with policy. How do you translate good theory into good policy? Well, the, the master of the mint in, the, in England at that time, he found a great way to do it. His name was Sir Isaac Newton. Mm. And he decided to do it by executing people. <laughs> yep. Death penalty. Um, Carl Venelind uh, from Columbia University has, has written on the death penalty as monetary policy. Quite, <laughs> uh, uh, so the Thaler is still minted. It's still minted by the mint in Austria. Mm -hmm. Still one ounce of silver, and it still circulates, but it doesn't circulate in Germany or Austria. It circulates in the Horn of Africa, where it's still certainly a store of value and very occasionally a means of transaction. So commercialism's little tentacles are just about with us and no more. Perhaps not, not as prominent as we all think, but maybe, maybe hidden in plain sight in musicals in the Horn of Africa. Very much so. Uh, does, is there any final questions? For uh, Philip? Russell asked about China, but nowadays, what country would you say comes closest to um, cameralism? Well, uh, that's a difficult one. Um, I mean, of course, there's, I mean, this is way out of my comfort league. I'm a medievalist, early modernist. But uh, in terms of the varieties of capitalism in the 20th and 21st century, um, you see clear differences, different models. So the Scandinavian countries are very different from the UK. Once again, very different from the United States, not only in terms of regulation of markets, but also ideologies about competition and what the state should and the state should not do. And then you have the example of West Germany, which develops a very idiosyncratic um, form of neoliberalism, and that's called order liberalism, a very sort of mm. German yeah. way of, of, of framing the market. And many of these philosophies that kind of flow into order liberalism obviously have borrowings from, from Kamalism. And, and the whole idea about currency stability is the sort of primeval goal of economic policy, which really kind of creates not only the Deutsche Mark, but the, the whole myth of the, the German Wirtschaftswunder, the, the, the stability and uh, the proverbial Deutsche Mark as a um, hard currency. Um, that, that definitely rings, I mean, with, with the cameras there, they're definitely. But also the idea about markets. Um, the order liberals are, of course, interest, interesting because many of them have a quasi-religious attitude towards the market, and they see the market and market regulation as a way of achieving a, a true Christian common wheel. So, so many of them, even though they're economists, say that this form of coordinated capitalism that we suggest, and there are lots of borrowings from the Kamalists, from early modern political theory, is the best way to align a capitalist competitive market economy with what God would have had in stock for us, with a, God, uh, a, a capitalist world order or market order according to God. And they were all, many of them were actually Protestant from a Protestant background. 
Well, somewhere in this library, I think we have Vince Cable's uh, last book on ordo liberalism. There's a whole chapter on it anyway. It's fascinating about how Germany endorsed that after after World War II, where it came from. Uh, you see, people say they've never heard of it, but they have heard of cameralism. It just has a different name. Yep. <laughs> Uh, I think we're going to have to end. See, that was much better than France versus Morocco, wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> and who, who knew that early modern uh, uh, economics could be so interesting? Philip, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.